Good morning. Today is Sunday, November 29th, 2020, the first Sunday of Advent. Welcome. We are grateful that you can worship with us this morning as we await the coming of the Lord into the world. Let us worship Jesus together. There are two announcements that I would like to highlight for you today. Our church annual conference via Zoom with our Chicago Southern District Superintendent, Reverend Jack Conway, is next Sunday, December 6th. Please refer to the church emails for the details. And last, thank you to those who have sent in your 2021 pledges. You are encouraged, if you have not made a pledge yet, to do so as the plans for our 2021 budget are underway. Your tithes and offerings are a symbol of gratitude to a faithful and loving God and support the work of the church locally and around the world. On Saturday, November 14th, 2020, the Northern Illinois Conference had its annual conference through a Zoom webinar, which was presided over by our Bishop, Sally Dick. Our lay members to the annual conference, Ed Ellis, Linda Graham, and myself, Gary Green, and our pastor represented our church at the annual conference. This year's annual conference was historical because for the first time it met virtually instead of in the manner of previous annual conferences where we met in person and interacted with each other. This year's conference was also very special because we were able to meet during the COVID-19 pandemic despite of the, the limitations of virtual gathering. Prior to the event, the Northern Illinois Conference provided opportunities through other Zoom meetings for the members to be prepared for the conference. We had a conference briefing and tech training to help us learn how to vote electronically. Many good things happened at the conference. Barrington United Methodist Church hosted the virtual conference and more than 630 clergy and lay members participated. Bishop Sally Dick gave her last Episcopal address and the scripture lesson used was 1 Peter 3, 15b. Members voted on important legislation, including the approval of the 2021 budget of $4.4 million, the reduction of districts from six to five, and the requiring of anti-racism training for clergy once every quadrennium. The laity address was pre-recorded by Elisa Gates, one of the conference lay leaders. The Bishop's Appeal Special Offering raised $36,837 for the secondary school in Tanzania, led by the Reverend Young Sung Kim, missionary to Tanzania from our conference. Bishop Sally Dick will be retiring at the end of this year. Our new interim bishop will be Bishop John Hopkins, a retired bishop. 
beginning January 1, 2021. He was introduced at the conference, a Chicago Bears fan. One of the people remembered during the memorial service was our very own Jack Ryder. The retirees, with a combined 422 years of ministry, were honored and celebrated at the retirement service. The music presentations at the retirement and memorial worship services were phenomenal. They were organized by the conference evangelist, the Reverend Rich Rubietta. Next year, there will be the 182nd annual conference session. In the months ahead, let us continue to pray for the churches and organizations and the people of our annual conference. Let us remember particularly Bishop Dick and all the district superintendents as they supervise and pray for our many ministries in Jesus' name. Thank you, church. Offered in peace by Ed Ellis, Linda Graham, Gary Green, and Pastor Sermon. Please join me in our call to worship. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you are, who are enthroned upon the cherubim, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, let your face shine, that we may be saved. O Lord, God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us the scorn of our neighbors. Our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Please join us in our opening hymn number 196, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. We will sing both verses. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are grateful for this morning. Thank you for bringing us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us, move us, and speak to us. Open our hearts to receive you, dear God. And as we prepare ourselves for the coming of the Messiah into our lives, into our communities, and into the world, I pray that you will help us to be awake and alert. Thank you and forgive us from our sins. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. For darkness shall cover the earth, 
and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ our hope. May the light send from God shine in the darkness to show us the way to salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Let us pray. Father God, on this first Sunday of Advent, we hope and trust in you as we wait for Jesus' birth. Amen. The scripture reading for today is from Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. I am reading from the New Revised Standard Version. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from our four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day, or our, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be aware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at the cock crow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
this year probably more than any other that I can remember in my lifetime. I am looking forward to Advent, to the watching and the waiting, to less hustle and bustle, more reflection and reading and expectant hope of the coming of the Christ child. Today's gospel lesson is from a chapter often referred to as the Little Apocalypse. It is set between Mark's recounting of Jesus' teaching on the Temple Mount and the Passion narrative. Jesus predicts the destruction of the Temple, and crossing over to the Mount of Olives, he begins to talk with Peter, James, John, and Andrew about the end of the age. Right before this passage, there are a series of warnings regarding false indicators of the end times. Jesus admonishes his disciples to watch and to wait, for the end will come, and they must be alert. The basic message of the apocalyptic vision is this. The rebellion against the reign of God is strong, as the wicked oppress the righteous. Things will get worse before they get better. But hang on just a little longer, because just when you are sure that you cannot endure, God will intervene to turn the world right side up. In Mark 13, things are bad, and they will get worse. The end is still to come. This is the beginning of the birth pangs. Suffering such has not been from the beginning of the creation. It will feel like the cosmos is falling apart. But before things become unbearable, God will cut short these days. Apocalyptic visions are always available to be recycled and applied to new situations. The point is not to predict specific events in the future. Rather, apocalyptic theologians look to understand God's mighty acts in the past as a framework for understanding how the people of God should respond to the present. In graphic first century language, our text reminds us that God knows that salvation is not complete. Many people in antiquity viewed the sky as the separating line between the heavenly and the earthly worlds. Sun and moon and stars were a part of the separation. Jesus says that God will erase the dividing line between heaven and earth by dislocating the sun, the moon, the stars. God will instill goodness in every heart and body, in every relationship, in every community. Christians today are divided on the question of how God will complete the work of redemption. Some continue to believe with Mark that God will intervene in the world in a single bold cataclysm. Zip zap, it's over. A few Christians believe that the liberation of the world will result from people struggling against their oppressors, like revolution. Some Christians think the redemption as a process that continues to take place as long as history lasts. God, people, and nature our partners, working together to replace evil with good. Patient, slow, relationship by relationship, community by community, God offers the goal. Once in a while, here and there, now and then, moments emerge in history when things are all right. Such moments appear again and again, for God never tires. We may take two steps forward and one back, or one step forward and two back, but God never slacks. How does God remain faithful in the midst of a crisis spiraling out of control? What are we to do or to think this Advent season in the midst of COVID-19, economic uncertainty, political battles, climate change, systemic racism, social injustice, and on and on. It would be so much easier just to take a long nap. 
than to try to stay awake waiting for the return of the Christ child. It seems that during Advent, we are often asleep to what really matters. Like people who have lived by the train tracks for years, we no longer hear the sound of the train. After years in church, we get used to the noise of Advent, to the coming of the Christ, so much so that we no longer notice it. We get used to the decorating and the pageants and the busyness and on and on. Do we fall asleep because we really no longer notice? Wakefulness does not come naturally to us. You may remember how in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy and her fellow travelers stray away from that yellow brick road and they fall into danger among the poppies. And as she lingers among the beautiful poppies, she was nearly reaches a premature end to her journey home. Unbeknownst to her, the seemingly harmless poppies lull her into a deep and potentially deadly sleep. And like those poppies, our world is full of attractions which threaten to lull us to sleep and to turn us from our spiritual journeys. Not all of those distractions are ugly or obviously evil either. Any number of things can lull and dull our senses to the coming of the Christ. An overfascination with sports or recreation or computer games or the internet or business success or our quest for the perfect home. Just a few of the many things which can distract our attention from the advent of the Christ child. Jesus seems to recognize the dangers. He wants us to stay awake, to take an inventory, to check out our fascinations, check out our distractions. How do you spend your money? How do you spend your time? Watch, for you don't want to be caught napping and have Advent pass you by. If you have ever had anesthesia before surgery, you know how it goes. First, there's this kind of static between the ears, and then the eyelids start to stick, and then sleep comes and the world goes away. There's no pain, no dreams. There's only darkness and oblivion. But there's another kind of sleepiness that most of us know about, which is a result of boredom. You have a three hour flight or a four hour drive or a five hour wait for someone to come to fix the washing machine. And with so much time on your hands, it can lose its meaning. It's hard to say whether it passes slowly or quickly. It does both, it does neither. Even if you find other things to do while you wait, you know that you are still waiting waiting for something you cannot make happen, for something that you cannot rush. And the sheer monotony of all that helplessness can put you right to sleep. Neither those who awaited the first coming of the Messiah nor those who await his return know when he will appear. Our contemporary anticipation of the coming of God's promised one at Christmas is quite different from the experience of those who first awaited the Messiah. After all, we know for whom we are waiting. We know the day that he will arrive, circled in red right there on our calendars. We have Advent calendars and Advent candles to help us to count down to the promised day. By contrast, of course, those who lived before the birth of Jesus did not know the day or the hour of his arrival. So they needed to live in a continual state of wakefulness. They needed to be ready for a surprise party on any day or hour. Also, in the biblical account of the first Christmas, most people never knew about it. Christmas didn't come to the business executives or the financiers or the writers or the senators. It even happened without television or Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. 
It happened rather simply, all in God's time, and it will happen again. But we join with the folk of old in hearing and needing that same exhortation to be watchful and keep awake. Christmas is a gift, not to be manipulated or managed into being a success. Churches can't even bring it off because it's a gift to be received, not an activity to be managed. It's worth staying awake because it is a mystery to be repeated and repeated. And our lives are starved for mystery. It delights and excites us, so let's not miss it. To watch and to wait, therefore, is to affirm that this present situation, this present condition, no matter how good or bad, is not the final realm of God. Waiting and watching presupposes that something is yet to happen, that the present is not the end of the adventure. There is something yet to be hoped for and lived toward. It's not over. Perhaps the best is yet to be. People who over the years have been able to change society and to make a difference in the world and in the way things are, are people who can wait. People who can wait, live in the present, but are awake for the future days. In all of this, we do not wait or watch alone. A nurse tells of working the 11 to 7 shift in a psychiatric hospital. And the employees were cautioned against falling asleep at the cost of losing their jobs. But staying awake when everyone else was sleeping was often a battle. Sometimes even coffee and splashes of cold water would not help. It was terrible to live in mortal fear of falling asleep and then to be awakened by the supervisor's cold touch and to hear her announce, go look for another job. One night, it happened. Toward five in the morning, the nurse fell asleep. And sometime later, a surge of panic hit as a touch on the arm and a call of the name brought the nurse awake. It had to be the supervisor. It wasn't. It was a nurse from another unit who knew that the supervisor would be coming and was checking to see that all were awake. None of us ever knows when the end will come for ourselves, for those we love, for the church, for the world. And all that unknowing can put us right to sleep because being asleep can be better than being afraid or bored or helpless. And so Jesus says, wake up. Wake up to whatever life is bringing you as a person, as a people. Wake up to pain if that is what there is for you. For you cannot be healed until you admit that you are hurt. Wake up to what is going on in the world. For you cannot hope to overcome it or help alleviate it if you do not admit that it is there. It is clear that Jesus does not intend for us to predict when he will return. But rather, he is urging us to live as if his return were just around the corner. It's been a long time since he came the first time. And we've been waiting a long time for him to come again. But how long is not really the issue. How awake we are is the issue. Our job is to stay alert, stay conscious, resist sleep, stay alive to everything that life is bringing us so that we do not miss God when God comes. And the good news is that we do not have to watch and wait alone. Just as in the garden, Jesus still stands by the drowsy disciples. 
Our spiritual well-being does not depend upon fearful, heroic watching. No, Jesus watches with us and for us. And we have confidence that we will not be sleeping at the crucial moment and that Advent will not pass us by. Our prayer hymn today is number 202, People Look East. We will be singing verses 1, 3, and 4. After I will share with you our prayer concerns, Reverend Cynthia Salt will do the pastoral prayer. Thank you, Pastor Cynthia. Now let us pray for Eric and Kathy Myers. Eric is Reverend uh, Dennis Beatty's nephew. Barbara Wiggle, who had a heart valve replacement, and it was a success. She is now home recuperating Yung Yi Fraser, Sharon Sabala, Sally Dicardi, Robert Jones, Susan Fulton, Georgian Kowalski, Cindy Perkins, Margie Jones, Kubos Grilla, Susan Bonivier, Andrew Morrison, Krista, Tom Sok, Phil Truby, Charlie Hall, Charlie had a surgery and it was a success charlie is home and doing well let us also pray for all those who are affected by covid 19 and also those who are without food those who are looking for jobs those who are feeling lonely and the overworked health professionals and essential workers let us also pray for safety, peace, and healing for the world. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, hear our prayers for those that we have named before you. We enter this season of Advent aware of our need to stay awake. Prepare our hearts to receive your Son. Awaken us to the continued needs around us. For those who are hungry, let us share food. For those who are homeless, let us show mercy. For those facing uncertain times, let us show compassion. For those who injure us, 
let us show forgiveness. In this time of pandemic, let us do our part to keep others safe. Open our eyes to the social injustice and guide us to stand for what is right. We confess that we have become sleepy and inattentive to you and your ways. Wake us up to the joy of living and working in your world. Chase fear away as we anticipate your coming and help us to watch and to wait with you. This we pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Church, I am grateful for your continued financial support to the church. Your generosity means a lot to me, the staff, and to our congregation. Our offerings this morning symbolizes our gratitude to a God who loves us so much and who provides. Let us give generously. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you. Please join us in our closing hymn number 719, My Lord, What a Morning. We will sing all three verses.
It is with eyes wide open that we boldly step into Advent. So stay alert, stay awake, and remember that you are not alone, that God walks this journey with you. May the love of God, the peace of Christ, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit bless you and guide you these days and always. Amen. Thank you.